Right. So yeah, you should use insert library or framework here. It's the bestestest. That was actually like um, the working title that I kind of sent Remy. And then I was like, I can't think of a better title. So I stuck with it. And I was like, well, it does what it says on the tin. So I was like, yeah, cool. And I thought what I'd do is explain how it is that I came to do this talk, in case Remy didn't fess up earlier. He said in an email to me, I'm thinking based on your last post, there's a great talk in there. But rather than throw you to the mob, and I think he meant that in the original Latin sense of lovely people. You know what he's like with his flowery language. Um, with your framework sucks. I was thinking a talk entitled something like data-driven decisions would be awesome. OK, data he wants, data he shall get. Pop quiz number one. Who likes coding with tabs? Hands up. And who likes coding with spaces? And now we have data. And that data says that many of you are wrong. Sidestepped it. <laughs> but, but going back to his email, he said, your last post. Your last post. <laughs> and it felt like that at the time. It felt like I was going to go up in flames, because I did the unthinkable. I challenged something to do with React. And it is like the tabs versus spaces. It's a, it's a topic we all feel quite dearly, isn't it? The, the choice of framework sort of reflects on me. Here's what I it did. I, I, it, I was like, React is popular. Cool. Let's go and have a look, see why everybody likes it. And I stepped into it. And I was like, these are the docs. This is what it says in the docs. It's like, yes, this is awesome. But it says the bottleneck is almost always the DOM mutation and not JavaScript execution. And I was like, huh? If I understand this correctly, if I were to write vanilla, I'd mutate the DOM. And when React is done, it will mutate the DOM. The only difference will be the JavaScript execution that we, we both go through to get there. I was like, this doesn't make sense. So I'm playing with React anyway. So I'm like, OK, I'll build myself a little test. And it looked like this. It's just a, a gallery. And it would add images you know, to the, the, to the page, 100 images from Flickr every time. And what I wanted to do was see what happens to that claim about DOM mutation versus JavaScript time. So uh, each of these photos is about five DOM elements. Uh, because you've got things like the last updated and the, the URL and so on. And the, one of the key things is that I include when it was last updated, because I wanted to invalidate the tree every time, because I wanted to see how well it scaled to see what that actually worked out like. Now, here's how I decided to test it. First of all, I would start two timers. OK, and the, the first timer will run. And uh, we'll do our JavaScript. So that'll be React in this case. And there'll be a little bit of parse HTML at the end of that. And I'll stop my first timer. Right, the JavaScript bit's done. My second timer is still running. Now I set a request animation frame for the start of the next frame. The idea being, when the next frame starts, I've done the last frame's work, the DOM mutation bit. So I've done timing framework, do all our other work, stop the second timer. Timer 2 minus timer 1 gives us our, our DOM manipulation. Time in framework is the first time. Does that make sense? OK. If it doesn't, stick with me. Here's what I got on a Nexus 5. Master just done a great job of explaining why mobile is the future. And I was like, let's see what it does on a Nexus. And this is what it does on a Nexus. This blue bit is the time in JavaScript as the number of elements goes up. Starts at around 500 milliseconds to just do the JavaScript, the tree diffing bit. And I was like, as it goes up, that photo count. So that's like, I think it ends up about 6,000 elements at the end. It was one and a half seconds just to get the screen updated, just to do the JavaScript bit. But the DOM mutation bit, the time between the first and the second time, is that bit, which if you turn your head slightly to the side and squint a little bit, looks like a pretty solid band. The claim was that bit should be the bit that's expensive, and the other bit should be the bit that is cheap. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know. And then you say, OK, OK, but fast compared to what? Hmm. Fast compared to vanilla for Paul. And this is the time in JavaScript for vanilla at the bottom in blue. And it's getting faster. And I think that's because V8's being a smarty pants and going, I can optimize your stuff. Um, whereas, obviously, the time in JavaScript, as we discovered for React, was going up. Now, one of the immediate uh, criticisms I got was, come on, Paul, nobody has that number of elements in play at once. So I thought we could have ourselves a little game of guess the element count, <laughs> which I'm sure is going to get picked up and be an excellent show format, and I'll get all the rights. 
But here we go. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a URL. You are going to suggest what you think the element count would be. <laughs> Firstly, the 2015 full frontal conf Two site. Million. Two million is our first. Any, any other takers? 38. 38. OK. 388. The 200 was close. Yes. Twitter.com slash rem. Obviously, obviously, I'm not signed in here because I'm not rem. Any guesses? Zero. 1,000. <laughs> Come on, play, play nice. 3,000. The answer is 4,501. The Google Play Music Listen Now, where it recommends tunes that you will get down to. Uh, this includes Shadow Dom, by the way, in case you're wondering. 3,231. The, uh, the, the Linux uh, contributor graph. <laughs> I see what you did. That's hilarious. Um, 5,050. Facebook.com when you're signed in. 2,936. And last but not least, the HTML spec on what wig? All of them. All of them is the correct answer at 143,000. <laughs> Which goes to show, if nothing else, that if you torture your data long enough, it will confess to anything. I could have given you six sites there that were all under 1,000, or six sites that were all over 10,000. The key, actually, is how big is the tree that you're dealing with, how much is getting invalidated for you. But there was something else for me about this uh, that I wanted to talk about, which was the responses I got on Twitter. Um, some of them were good, some of them were bad, and some of them were not very nice, actually. Um, so I'm, I've got a favor to ask. If you don't like the talk, first of all, blame Remy. Second of all, let's talk in the pub, where we can have a little bit of a nuanced debate. Um, 140 characters turns out not the place to actually have something meaningful chatted out. Anyway, I've anonymized these because I thought it would be a bit fairer to the people involved, because I want to capture more, in a, you know, more than anything the trends. So firstly, somebody said, I don't see you mentioning should component update at all. Now, if you've not done React work, this is the way that you lock off parts of the tree and say this component shouldn't update. And that's the thing I was kind of invalidating by you know, uh, changing the tree every time, like the whole tree. But there's an underpinning thing here about actually every framework. My analysis of this is that every framework ends up having best practices that you've got to absorb and go with. And we give it a nice name. We go, it's idiomatic. And we go, yeah, it's really, it's, it's just a different set of problems to what the web platform had anyway. So, you know, fine, but you, you're not getting away for free. If the framework goes, it's all free, it's fine, forget about it, don't worry. Something should, alarm bells should go off in our heads. Somebody also said this, an F1 car is fast, and I think by that they mean the vanilla, because it was fast, um, but you can't do your weekly shop in it. Would be pretty bad at showing up, wouldn't it? <laughs> Hi, just getting milk. My analysis of that sentiment, though, is I find writing vanilla HTML, JavaScript, and CSS is just too difficult. I struggle with this one because I've been part of uh, a good number of teams in my career, and we've shipped some sites for very big companies, um, and we didn't use frameworks. And it wasn't because we hated them. It's just the nature of what we did. And I. I never once thought, do you know what, the web platform's just so horrible, I can't. It's like driving an F1 car. <laughs> I, I struggle with it. Maybe others feel differently. Whoa, 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 don't do that to me. Oh, no, go back, go back. There we go. There's the next one. Perf is a red herring. Right. <laughs> now, when I was a little boy, I'm youngest of three lads, and uh, my mum, who's a lovely, lovely lady, uh, she used to say to me and my two brothers, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything. So here's my analysis. <laughs> You'd be so proud, Mum. Here's the one I think is actually the, the clincher, though. React isn't popular because it's fast, Paul. It's popular because it's fun. My analysis is having fun when writing code is more important to me than other factors. Ouch. I know, I'm tough. However, I think this is the important thing. What I think is really being traded here is this. Ergonomics, our ergonomics, our comfort, our happiness when writing code versus what those human beings at the end of the chain actually experience. That's what I think is really at stake. The ergonomics, I think, are these. Um, for us, that is fun to use. Uh, it's quick to build with it, and uh, 
It works around some, some lumps in the platform. That's a good thing. And uh, it gets me paid. You know, ultimately, being able to say, I can work with you know, insert whatever here uh, is great. Uh, the user also has needs, though. Um, accessibility is one. I could have probably included that. I didn't. I'm thick. Uh, that it loads quickly. Um, that it has smooth interactions. You might be surprised about that. Uh, one of my colleagues, Paul Kinlan, uh, ran a survey and discovered that that is actually, in fact, quite high up on people's lists. That it doesn't slow down their phone. It's annoying. It, obviously, it doesn't crash. You know, nobody wants a tab that's like, sorry. <laughs> and that it, obviously, that it has features that they want. But it might not be the top thing that they want. They actually might just want to get to the information. I, in that post that I wrote, I closed off by saying this, and it's something I'm sticking to. It seems to me that our ergonomics should be less important than our users' needs. I think that our job is to make users' lives better, basically. And that might cost us something. Pop quiz number two. Who has ever worked around a framework's idiomatic way of doing something? <laughs> Look at you all. Yeah, we're all in the same boat going, yeah, it's actually it's true. I believe the lie that it was quick to build because the thing I want to build is not quick when I do it not that way. Okay. Yeah, we're all in that same boat. Actually, I think it's fair to say all code is going to come with a cost. Cost to us and cost to users. Our costs are learning it. First of all, if it's a framework, we're going to have to take some time out of our days and we're going to have to learn it. And then one day, you'll be looking in the console and you'll see something like this. It's been, this bit's been deprecated as of this version. Please update your code to use Java, apparently. Um, <laughs> yes. No. So then you go through the process of relearning it. Right, OK, what changed? Right, OK. Is it backwards compatible? Is it going to break? OK. Pop quiz number three. Who's ever worked up against a framework bug? Well, you know, this seems wrong. You go to Stack Overflow, and it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, come hands up. Debugging it can be a nightmare, because it's not your code. It's somebody else's code. And you're like, oh, that's not good. User costs, there's just some, the time and the bandwidth of just downloading that code. The more code, the bigger the bandwidth bill, the more time it takes for the thing to bootstrap. When that JavaScript's come down the wire, it also has to be evaluated and processed and all the objects created and everything else, all that heap stuff. And if you burn the CPU, it's a rough approximation to battery life. So we're costing our users CPU and battery. Frame rates as well. How long does it take for that framework to update the DOM, for example? And of course, memory usage. If it has a complete copy of the DOM in memory, the memory usage might be a little bit higher than if it didn't. Now, at this point, I want to bifurcate. Yes, I said bifurcate. <laughs> Don't worry. It's good. V libraries versus frameworks. I think there's an important distinction here. And my esteemed colleague of Archibald um, had this to say a while ago about libraries and frameworks. And it, it, it made perfect sense to me. And I'm, I think it's worth, at this point, parking libraries. This is what Jake had to say. He said, this is how I feel when I'm using a library. So there's, it's my code. He likes to talk about holding both ends of the code. And there's bits in the middle that aren't yours, like date formatting or just these little, these little pockets. But if it misbehaves, you can just rip it out and drop something else in. Or you can even write your own if it's not too bad. Whereas with a framework, you end up feeling like this. You get handed little opportunities to do your stuff. And you go, please, could I do my job now? And you, no. OK. And it's like, OK, I'll work around you. How's this for not idiomatic? Right? So I think libraries, I want to park here and just focus more on frameworks. Right. Now then, more data. I got the heads up, because I think that email was June, July. So I was like, let's see what I can find out. Do the data thing. And I started, I was like, well, OK, what's a minimum viable app that might give me something to test? And I arrived at to do MVC. I thought, it's, well, we all know it. And it gives us something to look at. And um, I wanted to just start, for time reasons, and just look at these three. Time, bandwidth, and CPU usage in particular. Now, the thing I particularly wanted to look at was the bootstrapping or time to interactive question. 
So what that means is this. Uh, let's say we're going to request the JavaScript, and we're all used to that. And then when it comes back in, um, we actually have to evaluate and parse it for any framework, for any code. And then we're going to actually request some model data, because we can't just have an empty app. We actually have to get data to render the thing. And that will actually then need to be processed as well. And then, and only then, are we at a rough approximation of the app being usable. And this second bit I would call evaluation, load, and execution. And I wanted to test these bits. Okay. Now, the easiest possible way to do that uh, that I could think of was with DevTools. So if you have something like a phone, an Android phone plugged in to Chrome, as Marcy showed this as well, you can go to Chrome Inspect, and it shows you your browsers. I've got Chrome Dev here. And you can basically pop in, pop in the URL there. And this was the Polymer to do MVC app. And you can inspect it. Now, I actually have the JS Profiler switched on here, which gives you more detail about what's running. And I hit Command-Shift-R which is causing, it's going to cause the page to reload. And at the end of it, we get this breakdown of what was going on. And it's color coded. So the purple is Google Analytics there on the left. But I'm interested in pretty much some of the yellow stuff there. And I'm just going to focus on one, two bits, which was just this, which is um, the evaluate script. Just evaluating it was 87, sorry, 255, followed by a 90 millisecond um, sort of round of time. Now, I was like, that's fine. Uh, and you can kind of eyeball it and kind of go, this looks roughly about this much. But I thought I'd make you an alternative. Um, and so I've been working on something I call, comically, I call it Big Rig, because it's not actually that big. Um, but it's my little way of doing this kind of analysis. And uh, as of, I think, a couple of days ago, I open sourced it so you can find it. Um, but let me show you uh, using it, just so you can see what it's like. Now I will bring across. Big Rig. The Big Rig. Hello. Big Rig here. Uh, I'm signed in. And what I want to do is I'm going to create myself a project. I'm going to call it To Do MVC, since that's what I'm doing. And To Do MVC is that's fine. It says I've got no actions. I really apparently just can't be bothered giving you meaningful help. I'm just saying do it, would you? Um, if you create an action, an action inside a project is something that you're interested in tracking. So it might be loading or doing a response to a user action or something like an animation, like scrolling. And this would be a load. And let's call it loading. Why not? Something really useful. And you get to this point, and it says, upload a trace for this action. And I think most people go, what's a trace? That's fair enough. Um, it is, uh, in Chrome terms, it's the internal data that Chrome collects the a subset of which you find in a DevTools timeline. Now, most of us, when we do testing, I think, for performance, we'll use something like web page test. And I've got web page test open here, and I'm on Chrome Dev. And under the Chrome tab, I've actually asked it to capture a DevTools timeline. And because we're offline, I've already taken that test. And I was testing, in this case, the mm -mm -mm, I was testing the Ember.js to do MVC example. But down here, you'll see I get a option to get the timeline. Now, if you've used the web page, web page test API, you can also get access to this file. So with all that said, I've downloaded the file, did that this morning. And I'm going to go back here. I'm just going to give it to Big Rig. And it will process it, which may take a moment. And what it does is it starts to break down the costs for you of that action. So the amount of time you're spending in HTML, the amount of time you're spending in JavaScript, the amount of time in styles, in layout, in paint, in composite. And in this case, you can also play one of my favorite games, the blame game. And the, the blame game is where you go to the extended information. And you can see that we're spending 2.1 seconds, or in this case, Ember is spending 2.1 seconds bootstrapping on a Nexus device. So at this point, the main thread is just stopped. No, nothing else is happening apart from 2.1 seconds of Ember. OK? So that is, is, um, that's just for loading. It also supports these other actions as well. But I was also a bit like, I wonder if I could do one better, um, because not everybody wants to have a, a tool. Because you like, you've got an endpoint, and you can post to it directly, and it works with Travis and all that kind of stuff. So 
what I got is the command line version, which you can install if you feel like. And you can just do be like big rig file. And then if I get my mouse cursor, you just drop that in. And then you just tell it, look, pretty print. And if it does its job, yeah. Then you get exactly the same information out of this that you would have got otherwise. And you um, can then post that back to a dashboard, um, or you can win arguments like I try and do, because um, I'm fun to live with. Um, but then I was like, wait a minute. What if I did something with Chrome driver to do like scroll tests? So I'm going to push my look, since these two demos have gone OK. I also have, I also have the Big Rig Runner, um, which will do tests for me, like scroll tests and load tests and so on. Um, I am running my own site at localhost 4000. And I'm basically saying with that dash s, it's like, what, what am I looking for? What selector am I looking for to say that this is complete? What happens is the Big Rig Runner is going to tell Chrome driver to load the page. It's probably going to, knowing my look, it'll open on this screen, which you can't see. If it opens on that screen, that's great. Um, and then what it does is it spits out the trace into Big Rig, because you can pipe it in. So if that works, oh, it's done it. There we go. I'm doing nothing, by the way. And it goes, there you go. I've got a 59 frames a second scroll there. So all of a sudden, not just the to do MVC thing, but any kind of testing for this kind of work hopefully just got a whole heap easier. So you can find that on, on GitHub and go crazy, or if you want, uh, get it off NPM, which I'll show you in a sec. So you, it's good for responses, it's good for page load, and it's good for animations. Interestingly, if you do post to it um, from at the endpoint, you can see the web page test and the commit that actually triggered this. So this is actually, this is Paul Kinlan, he's, um, he's my colleague at Google. He actually started tracking, and you see it this, the, on the left-hand side, um, the very first entry, and there's that huge green and yellow, and it's settled down. It's because he uses Big Rig to track how he's doing on his performance, and he can actually see you know, which commit when he has a regression caused it. Um, also, in the blame game for him, uh, top of his is discuss. I've suggested to him that he might want to lazy load his comments. Anyway, Big Rig, you can get that if you want it. Um, the code is there if, in case you want to have a play. But where were we? Yes, we were back to me being unpleasant to frameworks. Um, those frameworks, this boot up time, I went through the process for some of them, uh, the, the more popular ones, and I thought, here are the results. Now, these are all running, let me see, what we got? La la la, the framework, the size, the bootstrap time on a Nexus 5, and then I eyeballed it on the iPhone, which was a challenge because you, you have to just kind of find the profiler and, and add the numbers up yourself. But I did it for a bunch of frameworks, and here's what I discovered. For Polymer 114, it's 41K, excluding the polyfill. Its bootstrap time is 409 milliseconds. This is just the amount of time it's spending in JavaScript getting everything ready. On an iPhone, 233 milliseconds. Bear in mind here that the Nexus 5 is uh, an iPhone 5, uh, uh, 5S. Yeah, a very, they're the very different hardware. So it's just for, because I knew people would want to know, really. AngularJS weighs in at 324K, according to Todo MVC, 518 milliseconds, and the iPhone 307. React, now the React to do MVC example is a bit funny in that it does JSX transformation with the JSX transformer um, kind of include a library uh, where, where they recommend that you don't do that and you use, uh, I'm going to say Babel because I can't say Babel, apparently. Um, and it is uh, 311K when you do it that way, and it has a boot up time of 1.2 seconds. Yep. We all went, oh, didn't realize. And 1.4 seconds on an iPhone. This is all time getting in the way of the user. I was, I was like, this isn't fair. All right, so I'll, I'll do the JSX, the JSX transformation and get rid of the transformer. And it brings it down to 162K, um, 509 milliseconds, a lot more in the Angular and Polymer time, and then 282. Backbone is fairly sizable, because it includes jQuery and underscore. But it's, you know, it's down there a little bit. And 168 there. And then Ember, which you might have got a hint from this before, is 580k. Just shy of two seconds. 
and 1.4 seconds. Vanilla, because we need a baseline. Because from a user's point of view, it's all identical. They're all to do MVC. 16K, 50 milliseconds, and 33. Yeah, take a snap of it, would you? <laughs> Commit to memory. Um, all right. Possible objections to pull. Oh, did you want it back? You want it back? <laughs> Tough. Because <laughs> oh, now I have to go through all those transitions. Be like, here's the numbers. One, two, three. No. Some, some possible objections. Um, somebody might say, well, look, to do MVC isn't idiomatic. They did that, they did that wrong. OK, fair enough, perhaps. But I ch chatted with Adi Osmani. And I said, look, is that a fair accusation if somebody were to make it? And he said, no, actually. We take PRs, typically the experts of those uh, frameworks, they're the ones who make the commits in the first place. Um, so no, I think I'd refute it. So, OK, fair enough. To do MVC isn't my use case. Mm. I don't build to-do list apps. Mm. No, you probably don't. But your use case is probably more expensive. Um, Paul Irish recently did an audit for Reddit Mobile. And he discovered a 22-second boot up for the framework that was involved on, an, on a, an Android device. 22 seconds. I think end to end, it was ending up around about a minute before you could use the thing. So if yes, it maybe isn't your use case, but your use case is probably more challenging, I would imagine. A Nexus 5 or an iPhone 5S isn't what our users use. It's fair enough. Those were the phones I had on me, and I happen to be um, lucky enough to have good phones, but the chances are your users won't have necessarily got those phones. Depends on your audience. You'll have to know what they have, I think, and make a decision there. And then the other one that people sometimes say is, well, it'll be better. It'll be better in the next version. <laughs> and I, there's a snarky part of me, and forgive me, but the snarky part of me, the cranky old man goes, why isn't it better in this version? But maybe it will be. So OK, keep testing. So perhaps then the question um, that people uh, ask is, should I use a framework? OK. Um, I don't always agree with uh, everything PPK says, um, but he did do a really good talk recently at um, Future of Web Apps. And in his talk, he had a section called The True JavaScripter. And uh, he described the true JavaScripter uh, as somebody who uses libraries and frameworks. I'm just going to go with the frameworks. Uses frameworks when needed uh, as the first part. I'm going to interrupt PPK with my own little additions. When needed, I think frameworks, for me, when I look at them, they're an inversion of control. And that, as a control freak, perhaps, but also as somebody who's responsible for delivering projects, that worries me. Um, you're responsible, um, but you don't have control. And that's, that should be a worrying combination. My, um, my, my wife asked me to go upstairs and get her phone uh, for her uh, a couple of weeks ago. She just, she just out of the blue, she went, would you mind popping upstairs and getting my phone? I was like, yeah, sure. I'm a helpful guy. So I went upstairs, got to the top of the stairs, and went at my brain through an insufficient location warning. She just went upstairs. She's done it again. So I was all right, all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. Found the phone, slipped in my pocket, went back downstairs and said, what did you say? And she went, do you mind getting my phone? I was like, yeah, but what did you really say? She went, oh, do you mind getting my phone from upstairs? And I went, yes, upstairs. Very vague, isn't it, that? And she went, well, it's your fault. <laughs> and I went, what? She went, well, if you wanted more information, you should have asked for it. I was like, uh, and I was like, I went, who's helping whom around here? And I did say whom, because I'm fun to live with, especially during a disagreement. I said, who's helping whom here? And I just went, oh, perfect story for my talk. Frameworks, who is helping whom around here? If it's an inversion of control, you should be helping me, not giving me little bits of time to do my job, I think. Back to PPK. He said, the true JavaScripter, though they use a framework when needed, will study them in detail before doing so. I think studying them in detail involves looking at all these. I only had time today to look at the time, the bandwidth, and the CPU usage. However, I have made tools for hopefully all of us to start grilling frameworks a little more in depth. And I want to do a bit more of that with you all, really. There's a lot for us to assess, not just the, how does it make me feel? I like it. 
hopefully, yeah, hopefully we make things that we all enjoy using, but what's the cost on the other side? Even though, even though I say that, I do think you should use data as a decision informer, not necessarily a decision maker. Um, I think we've all got brains in our heads. You might say, look, yeah, I know it's not great, but there's actually some good reasons why we want to go down this path. But for me, with looking at that data table, I was just like, I can't personally justify going down this path. You may feel differently. Back to PPK. The true JavaScript prefers to use a single one, single framework, I guess, per project. I don't know about you. Have you ever seen a site that uses Angular and Polymer and React all at the same time? Has anybody shipped one of those? Don't worry, don't you don't. Somebody, some hands went up. OK. Not my code. Not my code. Uh, great call. Developers, always in the back pocket, that one. Wasn't my code. Legacy. Legacy. <laughs> They left. They left. It's, oh, it's a mess. <laughs> we should start over. Have I told you about my uh, favorite framework? We should use that. Um, uses a single one per project, um, which provides that true JavaScript with a technical background to change a library or framework if necessary. There's actually an underpinning message here that I think PPK is driving at. Learn the web platform first. The web platform is the one on which these things are built. That gives you the safety net when these things drop out of fashion, or you have to work around their idiomatic way of doing things, or you find that they've got a bug. You can look at that code, and you won't be lost. You'll actually feel secure that you can have just gone and done something else if you needed to. So should you use a framework? I can't answer that question. I actually can't, because I think that's your question. I, the question I would like to sort of put to you is, when you think of your, your own needs and the user needs that you see around you, the human beings, do you see it like that? Do you see it like that? Do you see it somewhere in the middle? That's really the question. My argument is that if you focus, if it takes me an extra week, but every single one of my users gets a better experience, that was worth my time. You'll have your own arguments to make with your own teams and your own managers. But I would say, you should always focus on the people bit. They're the reason we do this. This is the reason I started building for the web a while ago. It's the reason I still build for the web. I've been lucky enough to meet some of the people I built things for, and they occasionally say thank you. And that's like, wow. And I don't like anything getting in the way of that. And I don't think you should either. Uh, so with that, I'm going to run for the hills and say thank you very much. <laughs>